welcome folks. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lisa Francine. I've been here almost a year and a half now, and I split my time between reference and reader services. If I can be of assistance in the future, just let me know. Um, Alan and Michelle Olson of Goats to Go in Georgetown, Mass. are a father and daughter dynamic duo with their business and knowledge about goats. Tonight we will learn why using goats for poison ivy and weed removal is an affordable and fun option to assist with your summer fall cleanup. Goats to Go will share success stories of project using goats and sometimes sheep to explore this environmentally friendly approach to pesticides and chemical use. And I grabbed a couple of different tidbits off the website of their history. And uh, there's a good pun, a bite-sized amount of history. Goat Yoga and Snuggle with Our Baby Goats, aka Kids, began in June of 2017. They own over 220 plus sheep, 130 plus goats, 30 cattle, three Great Pyrenees guardian dogs, a llama, and three Austrian shepherd herding dogs. They manage 150 acres of farmland in Georgetown, and um, all those critters are there. And I just learned tonight they also have a farm, a sister or brother farm down in Florida. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers. So let's give a warm welcome to Goats to Go. Thank you, Lisa, and thank You're you, welcome. everyone, um, for having us come to Chelmsford Library. She reached out to us a couple months ago, and um, we're always interested in helping people learn about great ways of using animals in an environmentally friendly way, as well as it's just a lot of fun. My dad enjoys um, land and seeing land and helping people not get poison ivy, which costs a lot of money each year for people that get poison ivy. Who's gotten poison ivy before? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had it last year, not fun. So. Um, we kind of are a little informal. Um, we have some slides to show you. We have a lot of pictures, um, some props as well. And um, by all means, you can ask questions as we go. Any hard questions, I'm going to turn it over to my father so he can answer them. But it's kind of good for us to understand why you're here and what you want to learn about to make sure we hit all the topics. So I don't know if you want, we'll go around and you can just kind of give us a little bit understanding of maybe who you are, uh, if you live in Chelmsford or nearby, and um, what you came here tonight and what you expected to maybe learn. Hi, um, my name's Deb. I live here in Chelmsford. I'm a corner lot by trees and wood and lots of poison ivy. Um, so back in the side of my yard are very badly infested. Um, I've got lots of gardens and a house in a funny spot. Like my yard is just bizarre. So I don't know if it can work or not or if, if the goats can work around gardens and flowers and trees. The answer is yes. Sometimes they eat them on you too if they get out, but yes, we are. Yes. Hi, my name is Leslie and I also live in Chelmsford. I live in East Chelmsford. I do not have a poison ivy problem, but I'm next to a cow pasture, so I have hops, lots of hops, mm -hmm. and some bittersweet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested to find out whether or not the goats could help me with that. They eat those bittersweet and hops. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like a candy bar to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Lisa Taylor. I came to this country. I actually came to Chelmsford over 11 years ago to, to marry my husband. Oh. Uh, a few days upon my arrival, I did some cleaning in our yard. Poor thing. <laughs>
morning at lunch, as he told me first time that he could eat. But I, from that time, I started to ask my husband to buy a goat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what makes this good is that people, not just us, there's other people in the area too and all over the country that do it. We do everything for you and you can enjoy the goats. You probably don't want to pat the goats because then you get poison ivy, but we set everything up and we'll tell you more about that. Oh. All right. <laughs> we're kind of the, some of the people that just came in. It's, um, we're just kind of getting to know what you're interested in and what you're here for. Um, don't feel free if you don't want to say anything, just pass by. I'll go back to you if you'd like. Big, yucky area of the yard, and they just want to go away, and no one will touch it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm David, my wife, and uh, we live on a high street. We've got about three acres of heavily wooded land. We've been losing the battle with poison ivy and bittersweet for, oh, and garlic mustard for oh, yeah. 20 years plus years and <coughs> are interested in any solution that might help keep it away from the house. Yeah, I've actually hand-picked garlic mustard and I lived down in D.C. for a long time in Shenandoah National Park. There was an area and we had to do three years worth of picking it from the root system, so, but. Yeah. Yeah. Dad, do we have any experience with them eating? Um, I can't answer that. No. They eat most everything. I mean, some things they don't. Yeah. And they That's acquire taste for different things if you push them to eat certain things, too. So. And I, I don't think we've ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Scott, uh, same as everyone else. I have a poison ivy problem. So we got poison ivy, bitter, sweet. Um, those are some. Good ones we've heard so far. All right, I'll go with you. We have a little. We have about two acres fenced in. We have a little bit of poison ivy, but we have a lot of rock, a lot of brush. Brush, rocky. Or no, it's not real rocky, but it's uh, it's up against most of it's up against the fence. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of poison ivy around the house. Mm -hmm. Well, the thick stuff, you'll see videos that they get into thick stuff, so. Um, we'll jump back over to this side. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, we have, we've been like clearing off our yard for ticks mostly, so we have behind our little fence lots of overgrown mess that we'd like to take care of, but we're afraid, I'm afraid to go back there because <laughs> I don't want to get the ticks. <laughs> ticks, <laughs> yep. So they obviously will eat down the brush, which is, adds to removing ticks, too. They don't, I've gotten that before, the, the goats don't themselves eat ticks, but, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm Ruth. Hi, And uh, poison ivy seems to be uh, getting close to the house. Uh -huh. And I go out and I pull it. I get all dressed up and I can pull it. <laughs> and then uh, next year it's right back. So you wear a whole jumpsuit and you would get right in there with the poison ivy. So you definitely don't want to burn poison ivy. No, no. I put it in a plastic, black plastic bag. Yep. <laughs> I let it bake in the sun and then in the fall it comes out in the trash. Yep. <laughs> I'm Donna. <clears throat> I live in Chumsford and I'm here basically just for general information. Right. I'm Karen and I'm in Chumsford and we uh, wetlands behind us with a chain link fence with a lot of grapes on them, but now growing into these grapes is lots of bittersweet. <coughs> I was kind of wondering if we had it all taken away, mm -hmm. will it come back because the roots are still there? Mm -hmm. Next year we'll be dealing with it. We have a spring that's not so much there, and now it's overtaking the grapes. Yep, so the bittersweet's kind of suffocating the grapes that you have there. Mm. I'm with her. Um, you're with her, so you got the same problem. <laughs> Bittersweet does some nasty things, but cool things to trees for art. So, um, well, I'm just not bringing a piece of bittersweet. Yeah. I, I don't know if anybody's got real bittersweet or if they just have bittersweet. Do you have bittersweet about as big as your arm? That's not an exaggeration. Up, yeah, up, up the, the tree. tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. as big as your arm. It's like a, an and then it pulls the tree over. 
Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Yeah, I have some pictures yes. showing that. And it can actually twist trees. And it, trees are expensive, especially if you're using it as a buffer for sound or you know, neighbors or you have industrial behind you. So those trees are important. To plant them, it's expensive. So come in and you can get rid of that. Um, gentleman in the back, if you are interested. In well, I was a trustee for about seven years. And um, about a month ago, I, I met, that, met the husband in, in Concord, New Hampshire. Huh? You know, it's her husband. Uh, and right now, I'm working with trees. I, I have a chestnut tree that's like the size of this, this building. And it has seeds on it. Well, I can't see the seeds, I see the outside of the seeds with the needles. Maybe if you want to try one when they fall down. You gotta get them quick because the um, animals are going to get Chestnut tree. All right, we'll jump back on this side. I'm Mary, I'm the council. I have a backyard full of plays on it. Thank you. To your left. I'm Molly. You're from Lowell. Um, I heard that goats. So poison ivy just keeps getting thicker and thicker, mm -hmm. right? So, well, thank you all. That helps us. Um, I'm Michelle. This is my father, Alan. He's the ones, the brains behind all of this, and um, I just enjoy helping as well with the goats. We have a little bit, and I'm going to kind of flip through these things. Um, feel free to ask questions, but it's kind of just a little introduction. We presented in um, Nashville in December, so these are kind of slides that I prepared then, and they work well for basically any audience besides children who I was with this morning. So basically what you all just said was you have uses that you want in different areas and you cannot use your areas because of poison ivy or other things. So basically this is a problem all over the place. And you can see here, this is um, a backyard, um, someone's like swing set, there's poison ivy and other things there. Dad, do you know more about that picture than me? You know, this one here, unfortunately, what they were doing to this is they, they've been using, they, this is when kids play, they've been putting chemicals and Roundup and wiping up that area. And I said, do you realize what you're doing? I mean, do it every place else if you choose to, but not there. So everywhere there's a problem. And a lot of people don't realize that there's all sorts of different ways that you can remove it. And one of them is using uh, animals, goats. Sometimes sheep will eat some of the forbs too. Sheep eat um, more grass. So sometimes we do a combination ourselves with grass. We're putting sheep so they'll eat people's lawns a little bit because everyone says lawn mowers. Goats are more eating the brush, eating things that are thick. So they like anything that's challenging and they all kind of have a frenzy effect. So some of the things that we all talked about here is poison ivy, multi rosa flora, poison ivy, multi rosa flora, um, buckthorn is another common one, and then oriental bittersweet. So those are some of the biggest ones in this area and the things that our goats really like to eat because they're here and we're constantly doing it. So as my dad showed you the, that swing set, you know, those kids are out there playing and there's poison ivy. So it's very expensive to treat poison ivy each year. And they say that's one of the largest like, reasons why people go to medical you know, facilities to get treatment. I myself was on steroids for three months last year, and I only had a small patch of poison ivy here, but it was a side effect to it that took me almost six months and I was not comfortable. So that was not fun. <laughs> so given a little bit background about us, um, we are in Georgetown. Um, our office is in Methuen, so um, we're about 20 minutes. We came over here. Back in two, we've had the farm for over 40 years. Um, back in 20, um, 2012, my dad got, that's me, back in the 1980s, um, with a bunch of sheep. That's my favorite picture. And then we got a, maybe three goats my dad got. And they just multiplied. And then we got five, right? And then we got 30. 
And then we've got, this is actually sheep in this picture, Katahdin sheep, but then we got over like 200. So with our sheep and our goats, we've got a lot of animals. And I say my dad never goes small with anything, so that's how we get where we are. So animals are a lot of fun, but they're a lot of time too. So we try to use the different, these are the different ways that you can use it. We've done a lot of jobs and we'll give you a little bit more information and show you some videos too. The things that we've done is we've had a lot of federal, um, state and private. Right now we're actually competing for a job down in West Virginia in the mountains um, for the National Park Service. And we've done a lot of transfer stations, my father's done, um, mostly sheep there um, because it's mostly grass. Parks and Recs, um, Danvers Dog Park we did a few years ago, did the Braille Trail in Boston on the Charles River, which um, obviously you can tell why they'd want to get rid of poison ivy there. Um, solar farms, some energy recovery facilities and schools. So another one that we've done is endangered landing turtles and there's a big habitat on the Georgetown Groveland line. And in order for them to um, be able to um, lay their eggs, they need to have vegetation, no, no vegetation on the mounds. So basically they would go in and hand do that and the goats came in and helped with that. At no charge. At no charge, yeah. Um, so sheep are usually better for solar panel, panels just because goats like to jump on everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here's also a transfer station, um, Avanta over in Haverhill that we've worked on and it's mostly grass. And then here's just a backyard with just showing we did both sheep and goats. So the cool thing about goats is everybody has that stone wall or the fence that you can't mow to get in there, right? And the goats are really effective at that. The best um, thing that we have is this poster, which um, I can make a bigger one later, but it just shows you that this is before, that's a rock wall that you can't see, and then this is the rock wall that you can see. So it's a great way to get in there. Um, for them to pass it around. Yeah, we can pass it. And by the way, the reason the reason that uh, this wall got done, this was a beautiful garden over here. But the reason this got wall got done is so the landscapers wouldn't go in. <laughs> That's a typical issue. Yeah. And um, so it's just the job that we did. We said, boy, is that come up? So. Goats will go into those hard to reach places as well as on like stream banks that you have scented. Um, you can have. Res um, erosion and they can help with that so that you don't have to get in there with a big mower. But the one thing that goats are really good at, if you can see here in the pictures, um, that's really thick stuff and the goats jump up as high. They'll try to get up as high as they can. What I don't have in this is that then you get a zillion other goats that come around and those that that's in Florida actually at our place in Florida, but the bigger goats will knock down the branches and you'll have five or six goats and they'll all eat the entire thing until there's nothing left. Behind the scenes, the setup, that's one big question I get a lot. I got, got an email last week. Somebody was asking, well, I have a backyard that's small, but we don't have any fencing, so I don't know if I can use goats. But most of the people that do the goats, we don't want you to have to handle the animals because everybody doesn't know how to handle animals, but enjoy them. So behind the scenes, we have a lot of uh, equipment to be able to transport them to different locations. and. Um, and they can do small jobs or large jobs. And my dad personally goes and looks at all the jobs to figure out how many goats you need and what type of vegetation is there, if there's anything that could be poisonous to the goats or the goats won't be able to eat it because it's too thick. So sometimes you have to cut pathways for the animals to get deep into the areas. Did you um, so we divide the different areas. Here's some of our fleet that we have a lot of trailers. As um, Lisa mentioned, our farm, we have a farm in Florida, which we bring all the goats and sheep down and give birth um, down there, most of them. We have 50 baby lambs that were just born in the last two weeks. And then we have um, a bunch of um, trailers that are around here that we use as shelter as well. So this is a ramp, this picture, Dad, the lower one, is um, a setup at a job. We just back up the trailer if we're able to, or a pop-up pop tent. And that's an important thing for animals to have is food, not just the vegetation they're eating, so grain, hay, shelter from the rain, and because um, they don't like getting wet, and then the sun, so they don't overheat. And they can kind of veg out in there and have their own space. So we back that up when it has self-watering as well in there. And then the electric fence also runs off of that, and it's self-containing if we don't have any hookups for electrical. So we can kind of get almost anywhere. If there's, we've, we've done stuff in Gloucester. What do you think's in Gloucester? 
rock. It's all rock. So we have ways to do the electric fencing to keep that up too. So here's some of the goats hanging out in the trailer. And then we have guardian animals, which is a big thing to keep them safe. So we have about 35 baby goats that I use for some yoga and snuggle classes with people. And we use Yeti, who's in that picture right there. He's a great Pyrenees dog. And they actually live with the animals to keep them safe at all times. We have a big coyote problem. So we haven't lost one since we've had them. He was a rescue? He was a rescue, yeah. We have him that was a rescue and Pooh that was a rescue. Pooh's and the lion was a rescue too, you know? Yeah. Lama. Lama. Yeah, Dolly Lama. <laughs> yeah, her name is Dolly Lama. She's cute. So she hangs out with that. That's some sheep there. And then we She's actually got it. Llamas don't like canines. Pretty powerful animals. Yeah. And then we have a new dog that's just 10 months old that we got out of a field in Tennessee. We drove my dad one drive all the way to Tennessee to pick the dog up, and he came right, living right from goats. That's where he was born. So um, basically, as you, the problem is that the vegetation just takes over your backyard. You can't use it. So you can help control it as well as you can eradicate poison ivy and other things with multiple treatments. Um, we had some test plots out back at our house that you hit poison ivy early in the year. That's one thing I get asked a lot about is, well, they can't eat the root system. They can't eat the whole plant. How do you get rid of it? But if you know anything, it, 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 um, it stresses the plants enough that they can't really thrive that year. They will grow back. It will grow back in another few weeks, depending on how much rain and you know how the conditions are. But then you can stress it so it can't grow really well. We hit it again in the fall when it's going dormant, so it's going to go into hibernation. And they're trying to store a lot of things. And basically, they, the goats will stress it then. Hit it again in the spring before it starts germinating and, and, and um, um, growing. And you can, you can reduce the amount of poison ivy. And you've had whole fields out back that you've basically removed poison ivy from. Um, we talked about bittersweet. This is a picture of um, bittersweet strangling the tree. And it actually that's twisted. The that's the tree. Yeah. That's the bittersweet. Right. And then um, this is what sometimes it looks like afterwards. This is actually American bamboo, not weed. Um, and we've got a whole book on that. We've been doing a study since May that it grows back extremely fast. This is one species you cannot kill. And uh, we've done tests, and my dad can tell you more about that. But basically, the root systems that you can see in this picture, there's already stuff coming up after the goats have hit it and wiped everything out. So some fun videos. This is um, goats in action last summer. And I think this summer we went over there too, didn't we, to West Parish Church in North Andover. Um, basically, this is how thick it was. They had gravestones there that they'd never seen. So this is what it looked like afterwards, after they hit it. So they're kind of fun to watch work. And they jingle their bells. How long did it take them to do that? It's relevant to how many goats we have and how dense it is. We put 50 goats in there. So, I don't know, I mean that, that is a week. It's all relevant. It's all relevant in terms of. Yeah, we started with 25 and then brought in 50, so you can kind of estimate. <coughs> Goats can eat. They they say about seven to eight pounds a day. So and they're pretty um, they're pretty efficient. They like to eat. So so the, yeah, this is a pretty cool project to uncover sensitive areas. Um, and here's a couple other videos um, of the goats eating. So it's kind of fun to watch that. That's the Braille Trail of Watertown. Mm -hmm. It was right on the Charles River, no chemicals. That's a lot of things. So you can see the goats are eaten high into the tree, and they'll get that whole bit of tree. So we're getting goat-tastic results with a lot of different things. We have had some successes as well. But this is um, someone's backyard, like or a wall next to an interstate that had tons of poison ivy. You can see how thick it is, Dad, if you have a little pointer. It's really thick. And this is what it looked like afterwards. Couple days. Two couple days, 10 goats. Um, and here, I, this is a bigger picture from the one I showed you earlier. It's just the sensitive habitats. 
and then um, they like lay the eggs, and this is what it looked like afterwards. After it's all clear, it's just all dirt. So some of this is, like I said, this was for a presentation, so I'll just kind of skip through this. But that's kind of our goals, is to help people in a more environmentally friendly way use animals and um, teach them that that can be an option instead of just manual burning or um, pesticides. So um, another thing people don't realize is this is the, really my, fav my dad's favorite chart, is that what the different animals eat. So they kind of eat different things. So, so goats eat high. You saw them, they start up here. It's, they'll reach up on their pine legs for one leaf and leave a big pile of green on the ground. That's their <laughs> choice. They, they don't eat grass. That's part of the way of, of resolving the invasive system. Is they, they prefer not to eat grass. And when you're trying to deal with invasive, trying to take care of invasives and bring something back, you want to get rid of the invasives and leave the grass alone. And then Forbes, I always thought it was a funny word. That's kind of bushes and flowers and stuff. And they both eat that well. Um, cattle, we always see somebody's with cattle or horse in the yard. They go, well, they'll eat this stuff. Cattle do not eat bushes. They don't eat Forbes a lot. They eat grass. Um, so that's. And out back at our house, my dad put in cows and horses into one area. All the poison ivy was standing. Then he brought in sheep. It was a little bit, they'll nibble at it a little bit, and then the goats came in and they just wiped out the poison ivy there. So this is a bigger picture of what um, we passed around, and that's one of our favorite pictures and a little quote I made up. So I do have some other videos um, that are fun to watch. To lighten the mood for a second, this, I don't think we have volume on this thing, but the volume's pretty good when you have the jingling. So everybody's got to have reading, and I have a, a lady that's an assistant principal at, um, at Reading High School, and she comes over and hangs out with the goats, so she summer had a summer reading. reading program. So <laughs> Goat Your Summer Reading is a little video that she did, and it, she's been making some video clips. So we have a lot of fun with our goat kids as well, so they're not always out working. So that's Cole, he's a little mischief -y one. And then Panda 2, she's actually 17 months old. Oh, that kind of skipped over. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Can you talk a little bit about fencing? I saw in the- I would, I'll talk, talk about it. Yeah. How's that? So, um, oddly enough, um, we're not here um, trying to solicit goat business. We don't need it. We have plenty of it. Um, and it gets a little far. And if you call from Chelmsford, I go, ah, I'm a little, little ways out. Of course, I say that. And then last week I was down here at the Lighthouse School because they, um, they have a problem there. And that they can't use any chemicals whatsoever. I mean, almost nothing. And uh, they have some issues down there. So they, in fact, um, call us. And it's a, it's a different type of job. It's a big job. So I said, we'll, we'll come there. So the, um, the fencing is. What happens, you saw the trailer, so we bring the trailer. This is heavy to pass around, but I, but I, I will make it available. Um, this here is actually five feet high. You saw the pictures. There's a little stick in the ground. We stick it in the ground. This is a temporary electric fencing. And now um, this here is this here is a plastic, but it's got a little fine stainless steel wire through it. So we have, as you saw, a fishnet basically that goes around. It's, uh, we run it off the battery, but there's a charger, or I mean, a, it just pulses, and we run it off a battery out of the trailer, or we, um, or we run it, we plug it into the house. Either way, it goes that way, and that's how the, the fencing goes, and it just goes around the whole thing. It, again, it's awkward to pass around, but I, but I will. So the, um, so that, so what happens? We put the trailer, the fence goes around the area, the affected area that we want, and then we bring it back. Yeah. The um, landscapers tend to uh, not want to go in where the poison ivy already is, so that, that works out. It works out well. The types of animals we choose. If we had a, if we had an area that was a lot of grass, um, a lot of grass, then we want to use sheep because sheep won't be down there. We'll all we'll mix them, and if not, we've already talked about that. If not, we want to use goats. The process of um, the process of, of Killing the poison ivy is, uh, is, is, a, is 
it's the process of stripping the plant. So what happens is the, the animals go in, they strip the leaves off the plant. And then when they, when they do that, it takes and it, the plant says, hey, send up some more energy. So it sends it, but eight weeks later, it, stopped, it starts growing again. Sometimes it grows back even more ferocious than you had it. It comes back with a vengeance. And then you, you strip it again, and then you, so you, it's a multiple process. It's probably, to really get with the program, I mean, you mow your lawn more than once a year. So to get with the program, you, you do it probably three, four times. And that will eliminate it. Uh, she talked about a place, we bought 20 acres next to our farm. And it had some massive invasives, it's probably with a picture of, of some of the bitters we were. We had everything you can imagine, and, and poison ivy that was um, almost in bushes. And um, I, I tell people all the time, so I actually took a walk down there the other day, I haven't been down there in a while, and it's, it's gone years, it's been a couple of years now, there's nothing there, just a little bit. Mother Nature never lets you kill everything. Okay. Um, so they stripped the plant and they just suffocated. It's not as tough as you think the poison ivy. Even though it seems to grow back when you pull it up, it's not, you know, and that's probably the best way to do it, by the way, is pull it up if you're good about it. Because you have to be careful because you could be having your wedding and you think you're doing the right thing and you're patting that goat and you're going to get poison ivy on the goat. Ooh, yeah. The oil on the goat. And, uh, so those are, those are problems. So the issue gets to be one of, of constantly going in there and um, it just, so it doesn't happen in one day. Um, it, for those that, that are interested in goats, goats are the most fun little animal. I mean, they are, um, we talked about, sorry, we just talked about his, her son, his, her daughter, his, his daughter had sheep for the summer. I said, goats are a really, a really personal one. So the, um, that whole process of, of um, eliminating invasives. We have invasives all over the place. And they didn't just come today. And, and by the way, the correct name is Je uh, Japanese, not me. We call it American bamboo. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they don't just all of a sudden drop over here today. They started five years ago and they're invading us like that. Some of the invasives came over in the 1800s and, and earlier. Um, leafy spurge is an invasive, an invasive plant. It's, it's a pretty plant, it's yellow. It grows about this high. Um, it's, it's all around if you didn't, if you haven't noticed it. Around here, it doesn't so much bother us. Our, our uh, dump cap, we, we um, do the dump cap in our town. We, we graze it. It's really taken over. And it, what happens is, it gives off a milk. If you cut it with your knife, there's a milk that comes out of it. And that milk will burn you. It's, it's not, not gonna, but it will burn you. And it'll actually burn, it's caustic. So what happens in the rest of the country we're starting to take over now, if you have cattle or horses out on the range, and that's, that's where you live, if that's the economy you live in, it, and this leafy spurge starts to take over, if it's taken 20% of the land, you've lost 20% of your land. Um, it, so these invasives, and it actually started in, uh, in, in uh, West Newbury. That's where they figured it first came out in 1829, something like that. But so the cows would know that if they eat it, their mouth's going to burn and it's going to pucker up and blister, and they just know it's a bad thing for them. So they, they're smart, so they now know about it, so they eat all around it. <laughs> and then how do you weed your garden so you have good flowers grow? You weed all around it. So they're actually helping the leafy spurge go forward. So that's just one invasive. There's so many types of invasives, but it didn't start yesterday. And, and, and there's huge economic problems with them. Again, we're not an agricultural-based society here, but if, if you made your living on, on your pasture and your cows, you know, and you lose pasture, it's a real problem. And it's 35, I think 35 states is it now. So there's invasives like that all over the place. Um, there's a whole list of them keep going on and on. And sometimes we, I even wonder when I'm doing it, I go, well, why is this invasive a problem? Um, buckthorn. It's a pretty bush. You probably have some you have it in the yard, you don't even know about it. And you go, okay, buckthorn. It's, it's just, I, I actually had some in my yard and I didn't know what it was. And, and, um, and uh, what, I, 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 one time I was into a th thing with buckthorn. We were doing the goats and it was high. It was about 12 feet high. And I was chasing the goats for some reason and I couldn't figure out what was going on underneath there. And I realized there was nothing growing under the buckthorn. Nothing but the buckthorn. So it becomes a monoculture, and, and it, you now have land in a road, you have, um, it just takes over the whole area, nothing else grows in it, you know, certain birds won't grow in it, I mean, just nothing happens. So the invasives, the invasives just keep taking over, and the, and the goats are the best way to do it, uh, dealing with them. There's a woman out in California, out in uh, Wyoming, Lanny Malberg, she's
she's got about 2,000 goats. And I guess she's got a couple of PhDs on invasive species, and that's what she does. She grazes. She, she does grazing out there. Um, pretty interesting woman. And the whole thing about the grazing is to, to bring some of this land back. Their little feet, um, I was watching something of hers last night. Their little feet, they, they aerate the soil because they're, 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 you know, they're, it's just functioning. So you're not, you're not um, destroying the soil at the same time. You're pushing a lot of the nutrients in. Um, that's, I don't know what else you do. Don't, don't let her get away without seeing the, the yoga picture. Um, I don't know what else to really say, but you have um, any questions, that's what we do. Yes? How do they, how do they attack the bittersweet, especially when you got that really big... Okay, so the first thing, if I, if I was to come to your house and you had the bittersweet, the, very fr the first thing that we do, let me talk about that piece next to my property. 35 years it had gone like this, it was over, and it was overgrown. Well, the very first thing that we did is we cut the, um, cut the bittersweet off, because the goats can't get in the tree. So, so you cut it, just cut it. I mean, I see bittersweet like that on people's property. I don't know where you are, we're going to sneak cut it. That's how I think about it. And um, you cut it off so it's all down low. And even if it's not goats you're dealing with, as it grows, it's going to start sprouting up little sprouts. And, the, and from the goats' point of view, they just, they just keep, they, they just don't live and get a chance. Um, in the same plot of land, we had uh, uh, multi-flora rose. You've all kind of bumped into it. It's just a thorny rose. It's kind of pretty. You just can't get through it. You can't get through it. They had bases like this. We actually cut it on top of the snow, and, the, and we had a bobcat to grab it. And um, I think six months later, the guy was still complaining about fawns in the hands. And I said, we'll never get all of this, because it's so, it has been so ingrained, so grown up. Um, same thing. It's just the goats, because when you, when you reduce it to a manageable size, I just have little sprouts coming up and they just, just kept nibbling away on it. So you want to bring things into a manageable size. Sometimes people will call us up and they'll be this, they'll, they'll call us up and it's just a jungle. And it's like, okay, we can do that. But, but you're asking us to use scissors with goats when you really should be using a chainsaw. You know, get the heavy stuff. Goats are better for maintenance. You know, to go in and to, go in to maintain something, that's where they work. Then they had to go in and take the heavy brunt of get in there the first and, and knock it down. They will do it. You can put them in there and they will just stay there and chew, 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 chew away. I mean, they get in places of those thorns. And it's funny, I watch them get stuck from that. Not, and they be in there, all right, I'm stuck. I can't get out of the bushes even. Um, and they, they'll just keep going at it. Uh, we've had places where we literally had to run them up. We have a you know, powerful mower. And we've run a mower, about get mower right through, so make some paths for them so they can get, they can get through. So if you were, if you were paying them by the hour, right, to work for you, and you can get the stuff knocked down, why would you have them in there for hours and hours? They, you know, trying to eat seven pounds a day a piece. So um, ideally, you cut the stuff hot. Poison ivy. When we go to somebody's house and there's poison ivy growing up trees like that too, the first thing we let the goats eat it, eat it, and be done with it. But then on the way out, we'll tell people what we'll do is we'll either use a machete or saw or whatever we have to do, we'll, we'll cut that branch. And now it's not up in the tree, you know, where you can't get it. I mean, that stuff gets up in the tree. I've had it on our first same property we brought next door. It grew up a big two-foot tree and it grew up through the inside of the tree. And I couldn't figure out, I had I to put goats around, a little fence right around this. I said, I'm going to get this thing. And it wouldn't die. I couldn't kill it. And that, then I found out it was inside the tree coming out of the top. So, um, so we'll go in and we'll cut that cut those big stems off so that we can be dealt with it on that level. So when you say it takes multiple trees, that's just one it's, it's, it's about three times about three times a year. It's about it takes about eight weeks for stuff to grow back. So it would be three times but the ideal situation would be three times in the summer, you know, in the spring, before the forest has to um, blossom with berries. <laughs> And then, and then the midsummer, and then the fall, when it's trying to put its energy back in, and then, and then again in the spring. Uh, that's really where it's, where it's. So it's not a, it's not a panacea of, of this goes away, it, but it's that's how it, that's how the process does work, and it does and it does work. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to sell goat things. I'm just trying. If you if you love goats and you had a little yard, I say get 
each stuff a goat and just let them two, two pick goats. away at it. And, uh, Their companion yeah, goats. And we get one. They, they're solid, not solitary animals. Um, and, and they will take care of it. It'll, it will be gone. It's a cost so. to maintain two goats. <laughs> it's a cost to maintain two goats. Okay. Um, Rain and hay. And yeah, but it's not, it, it's not it, you know, you have, to show, you have to enjoy them. Too. <laughs> yeah, you have to enjoy it. You know, it, it always costs more than it's worth it to yeah. maintain anything like yeah. that. But you have to enjoy it, but, but they're not, they don't need much. A little bit of hay. You know, I don't know what it would cost to maintain the two bills. 100 bucks a year for two. <laughs> or 200 bucks a year. She doesn't I mean, pay the I bills, apparently. Can you talk more about your success or lack of success with Japanese not me? That yeah, a very big problem. Yeah, that. I have a lot of that. So, I, I will, so this has been something interesting this, this summer. Um, we have some Japanese knotweed on the farm, which I think I brought in. And I brought it in because I had a property. I had a property on the Merrimack River. We caught a little strip of it on the Merrimack Conservation says, you gotta get, I, I took some of the dirt out of there and I, Conservation ladies told me, you gotta get rid of that knotweed. I goes, well, nobody else in the whole world can get rid of it. How the hell do you want me to get rid of it? So I, I, mean, I think we dug out with a backhoe three or four feet deep. So, and we brought it in. So we've got spots of it on the property. Now, J Japanese knotweed, for anybody that um, didn't know, it, it, you see it all on your roads right now. It's, it's about eight feet high right now. It's, um, it, it looks like bamboo. That's why we call it American bamboo. And, and it grows two inches a day. And I know that. I'm going to show you this little book I'll pass around. I'm going to pick up pass it around right now. Uh, the book is pretty redundant and, and pretty boring. Um, but if you go to pages, what you'll see is... is um, Skip through. <laughs> what I did is I just take a picture of it. Put the goats in it. What I'm trying, I'm trying to experiment. I'm trying to see what I can do to, to, to knock it down and, and even stop it. Um, it's got rhizomes for anybody who doesn't know what that. The roots go out. It's got little nodules on the roots, and um, and every one of those will grow another plant. So if you try and pull it out, you'll leave the plant in the ground. Now I'm going to do something right now. I just put a harrow on a tractor. I'm actually going to do something contrary to what I do. I'm going to take a strip of this test area and I'm going to harrow the dickens out of it which means I'm going to make all kinds of more plants, but I'm, it's just part of what I'm trying to do. We took in, we put the goats in in the spring, and uh, again, it's really redundant. The pictures are redundant, but if you look at some of them, it looks like the cow, it's just black. It's just nothing there. The knotweed is gone. They will take it, they will wipe it right out. They eat it, they will drop you know, down to nothing. Um, I haven't yet got those pictures to put on my But it takes, them, but it's going to come back. Right now, where I am at, I tell people when they call me, I go, "Sorry, I can't help you." What we do is with knotweed or phragmites. Phragmites is that reed that's in the marsh. You know, it's got the puffs on the end of it. Phragmites is a very invasive too. Um, American phragmites is not so invasive. The European one is. They will use this fodder, uh, so the goats will maintain it. They'll, they'll they'll knock it down. If you have that problem and you kind of like goats, I tell you, put a little fence up with the goats. Yeah. They, and they're going to eat it. So my, so my knotweed is like this high. It actually looks pretty. It's just kind of a little grass of it. And uh, I, I whip them back in. Every, I take another picture and I just don't throw them back in. Um, I don't have a lot of hope for you. Uh, you know, <laughs> because the other, the other approach is chemicals, um, which, which I'm not an advocate of because that's not what we do. But they, um, they, the, the time of the knotweed is in August. It's coming up right now. And um, so it gets ready to flower, and the bloom has got a pretty bloom to it. That's when they, they you take it, you can daub the, um, you can daub the thing with um, lysophosphate, which is basically Roundup. And that's how, that's how they try to deal with it. But it takes a couple of years worth of treatment for that, right? I, I don't hear well, it's me. I'm a couple of years worth of treatments to do that, right? I don't do a lot of that, so I don't, you know, I just know that that's how it, that's how it does work. I mean, you can spray it, but you, but you can just dot it, you know. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is I'm waiting for that with this patch I have. I'm going to take and I, I'm going to hate to admit that I'm going to do that, but I'm trying to do all different things. And I've been whacking this stuff, really trying to keep it down. And I'm going to take and I'm going to also take a little section of it and I'm going to try and dot it with life oxygen to I'll have to fence it out and it goes after this. I'm, I'm thinking my thought process is, then I'm weakening it, and I'm weakening it, and I'm weakening it, and I'm weakening it, and I'm burdening it, right? And now if I can hit it. So you just said it takes three years to do it. So I'm trying to do the reverse. I'm trying to weaken that plant to the point that it's, it'll be so weak that you know, the, the, the chemical will work. And 
I'm not an advocate of chemical. It's just it's, it's an experiment. So I'm trying to look at the different choices. And that's one other thing that we're always cautious about too, because if you're gonna if you've gone to a location that has been trying to treat it with chemicals, and then we're putting animals on that to eat it. So we always are asking questions, what's been on this in the last few years to make sure, you know, we know what is getting eaten by the goats, too. It's my question, actually. We already put down roundups on the point tonight. Did it work? It seems to slow it down. Slow it down. We're talking okay. an area the size of, almost the size of the or something. Right. Well, I'll talk about that. But what happens is, what happens is, it slowed it down. Uh, Monsanto puts out 240 million tons a year of, of uh, glyphosate in the world. It, it, it's just a phenomenal amount. You know what? It's 50 years of trying to do this. We haven't, we haven't killed the plant. Or we wouldn't be all sitting in the room talking about poison ivy. We'd have to do that before. No. Now, um, uh, Lanny Melba talked about that the other day. She talked about a plant out in Wyoming because I was watching the picture, and she said, this particular plant, don't matter what it is, yellow or something, she goes, they have hit it with so much chemical, it's immune to it now. Um, so so the, the length of time it's good for, we don't know that. I mean, believe it, even though I don't do chemical, I have a pesticide license. I've been to pesticide school. I went to an ag school. And the question I asked in pesticide school, where they're supposed to be telling us to be professionals and tell us everything we want to know, is how long is that going to last? How long before I can put my animals on that? You will not get a straight answer. Even the state regulators who are supposed to be on our side, they don't have an answer. Because the, um, the people from, you know, the people that deal with glyphosate, what they've done is they take, they've taken a, pitch, a page right out of the tobacco industry. Remember the tobacco industry? Cigarettes are good for you. And you know, they had all kinds of studies and permanent doctors doing papers and saying how good it was. And this was everything, you know, you, we all kind of lived through that. Well, they, they, they have the same sort of, they have that same page they're using. And they're going, it's harmless. Roundup is harmless, right? You've heard it a million times. It's, it's harmless, don't worry Asbestos about it. Asbestos was harmless once too. You know, so, so they're using the same, they're using the same MO. Now, how can you tell that, eh, maybe there's something going on? Well, first off, they think it's, uh, it's, it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is what, uh, what's involved with, with, with Roundup. They're starting to discover. And most of all, when you can tell things are happening, states like, and I, I'm not such a liberal, so I don't like, but states like California are now, and other states are starting to say the lawsuits are being allowed there. They're saying there's a problem. You know, and the lawyers are going to make money off of it. Then you know there's something there. Somebody's on to something. Ahead of time, we've all been just saying there's nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with it. The lawyer's not doing for anything, for nothing. So um, they start to become an awareness about it. It's got a good use, I guess, in society. It does have a good use, I mean, chemicals, but it's, it's, it's a chemical. It's dangerous, and it's got to be going in some ways. So I'm not a I'm How long really. do they have to wait to have to put them to get your animals? That's what we don't know. That's we don't question. really know. Yeah. So we, we'll we'll take and um, we'll put the animals in. We can we can look at it. If it's not all wilted and crappy, you know, then then it's then it's okay. We'll try and fence up, fence it out, or something like that. So I, I'm going to say within six months, within three months, you know, you can almost look at it. After that, I don't know what's there for residue. I I, I don't know. Just like that playground that I saw the lady because you know her kids are playing in that all the time. I mean, it looked fine, but it just kept the poison ivy away from the kids. But um, I don't, you know, we don't know how long enough. That's a whole different subject, really. Um, yeah. But it really is. Yes. Now, if you have any, I have an area that I have some good stuff that I want to keep and some right. good stuff I want gone. Right. So, like, for example, a convex leaf holly, a couple of mock oranges that have been yeah. overrun with the, the wild, that wild rose and the hops yeah. and the bittersweet. How, how do the goats discriminate? They don't. <laughs> <laughs> but if you like it, they're going to eat it. They eat it if they like now, that's not they true. They, they eat it. So what we, do, what we do to do that is if we go into, um, if we go into a situation and there's bushes throughout the area, night bushes, things you want to say, we literally build a fence around it. Okay. And sometimes we get, they get pushy. Sometimes they push the fence over. So, um, so the, we watch all like that. 
Now you go to other plants like um, Victor or um, it's a little ground cover, Victor? There's another name for it. Vinca? Yeah. Vinca? There's another name for it. But um, it, it's on a ground cover. And, 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 and your poison ivy and your weeds and everything grows through that. And you can't weed the dime. It looks so beautiful when it's weeded, but you can't weed it. You're like trying to figure out how to get it off. Well, the, I, I brought, I have somebody that calls me every year for that, and I put the goats in there. Right into the middle of that beautiful ground cover and everything else. And it, usually it happens by accident, how we discover this. And I always wait for them to make liars out of me and eat some of these vincta up. But they don't eat the vincta. They eat everything that's in the vincta, so they weed it all. They go around and pick it up. So there's some, some plants that they won't touch, and they just, it just works like a perfect combination of weeding the vincta and just a clean patch off, weed up afterwards. So do you know which plants they don't like? For the most part. Not always. Like I said, they make liars out of me. I'll be right with you. <laughs> The, um, what happens is um, ferns, you know, we all kind of like the ferns in our yard, they don't eat ferns. Ferns are poisonous. And they, they know what's poisonous and what isn't. Um, they're not supposed to eat cherry, or you're not supposed to eat rhododendrons, and they're not supposed to eat um, azaleas because they're poisonous, but they do. They, they actually create a little bit of a tolerance in themselves, and they can eat a little bit of other stuff. So <coughs> a lot of times, I, Standing here, I can't tell you which one, you know, but I go, oh, oh, if I was in your house, I go, they're not going to eat that, because I know you, well, I thought I wanted to get rid of it, they're not eating that, and they're not going to eat this. Just something. They eat most everything, but but there's things that they won't eat, you know. Uh, ornamental grasses. What's that? Ornamental grasses. Probably going to eat it. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, my wife says that when she was a teenager, they used to milk. Now you have to watch what they ate and milk them. What? They used to milk them and what? Well, were they watching what they were eating every time? No. Now, that's an interesting. I thought you were going to say something different, so I'll tell you. Um, what, one of the things, somebody told me uh, some time ago, and I thought it was, a, I thought it was a, an old wives' tale and a joke, and they talked about poison ivy and, and goat, they're grazing on, goats that are grazing on poison ivy. The milk gives you a little bit of immunity, and I just from all, I, I don't have I'm not milking goats, but but from um, all I gather it is actually a true fact. I think you have to look that up yourself. I mean I'm not, I don't want to possess myself to be an expert on that. So they do. So in fact they you know poison ivy. Now you got to remember this: if they're doing if they're milk if you're milking the goats, you get poison ivy on you. So hands too. But yeah, um, we get that. We get a lot of phone calls each year if, if um, we have milk for sale. Um, that the goats have been eating poison ivy, and I say to myself, would you want to milk that goat that's been in poison ivy? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we don't, we, we don't milk. We have, um, I, can, I can go in after you finish well, that. Yeah, just, so it's just a follow-up. So I mean, it, it have to, if, if you're really milking the goats, you'd want to be kept. With any milk animal, you know, you, you gotta, things are going to come through the milk. So you, I mean, if, you, if they're grazing on garlic, you're going <laughs> to taste garlic. So. You might, you might want to choose, but that, that becomes a husbandry thing of what you're doing with your milk. Yeah. yeah, so we get that a lot. Our breed of goats, actually, that we have, oh, yeah. we have um, a few different types, and one of them is a fainting goat, a myotonic <laughs> goat. So if anyone has seen that, we actually were on Chronicle last uh, October and, and December. They rebrand it. And that is um, fainting goats, so they kind of just have a nervous neurological disorder that makes them faint. So they kind of are called stiff leg goats, is another word, and they fall over. That's the majority of the goats that we have because we just enjoy the fainting goats. <laughs> so they, um, they're a lot of fun. Then we have, so the fainting goats are pretty, a smaller breed. They're like a medium sized goat. Then we have um, a bunch of boar goats, and that was one of the ones that I think. I think this last, I've been playing little video clips here. If you here look up YouTube, this is a board. Go tonight, you're going to laugh. Yeah, this is look Lucy. So we have Lucy and Ethel. They're one of the first ones, and her babies are my favorite every year. So that's a boar goat, and they're larger goats, and they're the ones who get right up into those trees, and the fainting goats just come running up over once they knock the tree down, and they have like a frenzy, a jealous effect. Oh something great going on over there. Let me go eat what that goat's eating. So they all come and they'll eat the entire tree until there's nothing there. Then they'll move on to the next. But that's also why we do the fencing. If you have, say, three or four acres or something, large areas, you, you put them in certain locations to target graze them. So basically, they're going to eat all in this one area before they move on three, 
two, two, two acres away, you know. So eat that and that's how we segment it off and you kind of do that to move them. The other type of goat we have, so boars are also a meat goat, and then we have um, Nigerian dwarfs, which are cute little guys and everybody always loves my littlest baby goats that I have. Well, that's because they're part Nigerian dwarf and we have some full breeds and they only get about 22 inches tall, so they're cute. So those are the three types of goats we have. There's other ones, tons of other breeds, but. Somebody asked earlier about um, successes and uh, failures. We had, I just had to consider a failure this summer. I knew the fellow. And um, we, we didn't have, we didn't put, it was out on Afghanistan, right out on the ocean. It's actually a pretty picture, but um, we, I didn't think we put, we didn't put enough goats in. We didn't get enough of them. Because you need, we want to, we want to do this gang grazing. We want to make small, so I still the whole library, we want to just do this room and move on and let this room get tapped really good so that they'll, they'll get everything and not just the things they want. Um, we had a place out in, um, that's a little fake, you over here. We had a place out in um, the marsh in Newbury, and um, it was beautiful. I said, this is perfect. It was all stumps and stuff was growing up. I guess they all love this. We had it all arranged with a lady. We could, anyway, she called me back within a day. She goes, Alan, we have a problem. She says, they're not eating any. What are you talking about? I rushed out there. And they weren't, lo and behold, they weren't eating anything. They were actually kind of complaining that they were hungry. But what it was, I had never seen it before. It is really common around here, sassafras. And uh, sassafras has got this really pungent smell. You, you take a leaf and you can, you can smell it. It's not, not offensive, it's just pungent. And uh, so, they, so sometimes they don't like certain things. They go, hey, sassafras. So I know now, sassafras they don't like. I looked at a, I looked, but, but I looked at a, a job in Gloucester in, in the garden for this estate it was on, kind of on the Innisfong River just recently, and I'm going through now from experience, and I goes, oh, sassafras, they're not going to eat that, right? And she was all excited. She said, it's a natural plant. Oh, thank God, because she's trying to keep this, you know, she, she wanted it. She, she told me, oh, this is great. She was all excited about the sassafras. So. Um, I think you had a question. Yes. The leopard fence to keep the goats in, predators out, or both? I call it the good guys in and the bad guys out. And the bad guy can be your little cute little dog. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, that's um, for for us in the locations that we go. That's one of the larger things. Uh, west is bears and coyotes, and that's why we also have um, our guardian dogs. And depending on where we are, we put them with we them. Don't, yeah, we don't bring the guardian dogs yeah, to your house. Out. I wouldn't bring them. I don't know where you live, but I wouldn't bring them to your house. It's a different. It's a whole different world because they bark all night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people don't like that. That's it. That's how they correct so. Um, so it, we wouldn't, we just use the electric fence. Some fun with goats. So we don't necessarily use our baby goats that we do other fun things with um, for the poison ivy because then that would be not very good repeat customers or people that want to come see the goats and hang out with them anymore. This is last October when we did a lot of costumes. It was actually a hot October so I would take the costumes off them because goats can overheat. But so these are all our little babies that are all different costumes and we're going to do it again this year. Just some lighthearted stuff we do with the goats. So we have a lot of fun with them. I have, um, I was showing Lisa before um, you guys got here, is, um, I have tons of videos on my phone of just hanging out with the goats, goat kids and stuff and just doing other fun things. So we, we, these guys will all graduate and my dad will get them next year. So, but I've um, taken over all his baby goats. So. We have uh, a lot of fun with them on the farm. Yeah, you have yoga pictures? Yeah, I do. Yes. So um, that's my little rascal. This is my, she's big now, but she's on the smaller side. Her name is Pianu too. Rusty. So. Right. Any more questions about the, um, we'll stay here and answer questions as long as you'd like, but any more questions about, about the mechanism of how it works? or? Or anything like that? Or what they'll eat, what they won't eat? Or? What about goats in wetlands? Good question. Okay, that's, um, anybody for conservation? That's a bit of a delicate subject, but it's not a delicate subject at all. Because for starters, we're not, um, we're not pulling, we're not cutting or anything else. Um, they're just de they're defoliating. Goats don't like to get wet, so they don't get their feet wet. 
So I'll actually use a little wet area or a little stream this big. I'll use that as a barrier sometimes. And they'll graze, they'll graze right up to it. I, I've had them on a farm pond, on a farm pond with a poison ivy which was like growing in, falling, and it was so big. And I, I actually get nervous because if they get over to the edge, and faint. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they'll just they'll just get pretty creative and, and just um, like somebody said if, if it won't hold water it won't hold the, 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 the. so um, they so wetlands wise we just we're doing we're doing vegetation control we're mowing your lawn you know and truthfully I'm not going to get into this but truthfully conservation commission probably tells you really you can't even mow your lawn within a hundred feet of wetlands that everybody's doing it all the time. I don't discover. So, can you graze with them then? I don't know. I've only had one uh, one conservation commission gave a person a little bit of a hard time. Sometimes they get the goats out of it. It wasn't even a whale. A swale, you know, by definition it was. But, um, but other than that, we, you know, we typically, we'll bring them right down to the water. We'll use the water. We'll actually put, not electric, but we'll put a piece of hard fence into the water. And we'll, we'll that's how we'll, we'll do it. Because if not, it just, you can't stop it. Like you say, you, you've been pulling the stuff, you can't stop it. And the uh, livestock cuts, you know. Yeah, the goats, I think you might have said, you, they don't like getting their feet wet. So the last two days um, I've had, I do a lot of fun things. And one of the things that I do with the baby goats is a lot of charity events. So I've helped MSPCA, Angel Flight New England, um, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, um, Pet Minist uh, perf uh, pe Perfect Pets Ministry, and some other ones, uh, Mass Bikes coming up. So you get to use the goats on my side to help a lot of um, charity work. So if anyone has a good one, I'm still looking for a charity for the September 22nd class that I have to just basically raise funds. There's no, no maintenance and no work that's done on whoever I'm giving the money to. So I do that we have fun. So this is the lighthearted side of um, what we do with the goats. And I get asked that a lot, well, what do you do when the goats get older from the things I do? Well, my dad really enjoys going to lot land and like discovering new things and being challenged by new vegetation and understanding what our goats will do. So we do that. And then we also do herding trials. We have our sterling shepherds and we do herding trials with some of our goats and sheep and other things. So they really truly are just kind of pets and have fun and we um, breed them each year and we get a whole new crap group of um, little ones to play with. And some of them can be as small as two and a half pounds when they're born. Really cute. Their head is probably like the size of like a golf ball, a little bit bigger. They're so, so cute. So, so this is a long video that I had that I just did a whole bunch of pictures from last year. These ones are all from last year. But all the different goats have different personalities. And the one thing that's good that what I'm doing with the goats is when you have so many of them, we naturally let our goats stay with their parents and we don't bottle feed them or anything. So they stay with them for the first few months and then they graduate to do this stuff. But it's also helping to socialize them so that when my dad takes over, they'll come right to your side and kind of walk with you. A lot easier to catch and, and um, work with. So. And goats are just very sweet. So, what fun. Has anyone seen this before? <laughs> oh, it just brightens, I, just the smiles on people's faces is, is great. So, and goats like jumping on things. So it's not like, I don't force, I have some goats that don't jump and I don't make them jump. They just do it on their own. We are incentivized by little treats we give them, but. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Um, I just thought I would mention for anybody who's in town, we actually have goats at our house right now. Oh, cool. They came, um, we're not far from the library here, and it's probably dark now, but they are going to be there for the next few days. Um, I'm happy to share if anybody wants to, like, stop by and check them out <laughs> while they're eating our poison ivy and our bittersweet, and I forgot what else they have in there, but those are the two biggest things that we have on the side of our yard. Um, and I know you mentioned that Chelmsford's a little far, particularly if it's a smaller project. Um, so we, I ended up finding a farm at, basically it's a, it's a smaller farm and we have right now five goats. I think she's bringing a sixth one. So it's just a, it's a smaller group and she's obviously willing to come to Chelmsford. Um, so I'm happy to share her information, not to take away from her. Oh, no, 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 no,
Yeah. I have yeah. all go through this idea. Yeah. We kind of enjoyed doing this when we were asked to come here and do stuff like that. Yeah. And I encourage it. I mean, we're finding more and more of it. So yeah. you'll, you'll find you're going to meet more neighbors than you ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's great. We actually would love to hear who that is because my dad. Sometimes we get calls for ones that are just too far outside of where we'll actually be able to go. So um, that we'll. Uh, See, one of the things that I, when we put goats out, I want to be able to drive by and check them. We're particular about our goats. We want to, we want to be able to drive by and check them. Or if you have a problem, let's say um, the neighbor's dog tore the fence down and the goats were all over the neighborhood. The last two weeks ago on the news, there was 118 goats all over the neighborhood. <laughs> okay. And it was funny, I, I watched it, it's like, you know, the news, it's like they, people are trying to figure out what to do with these ghosts as they eat all the grubs. So uh, when you call me, I want to be able to get there. It, not that this is that far from Georgetown, but uh, so we, we try to restrict it to those people. And, uh, there, are, there are a couple of people. There's um, somebody down the south shore that does it. Uh, you know, two girls out in the Amherst that do it. If you've got somebody else looking for doing yeah, that, great. They, um, the farm that we're that we're using right now is Maple Doll Farm. I think you called them because I gave I gave him the number a few weeks ago. Actually, to call them for something. Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. I've seen yeah, they pictures. have information on their on their Facebook page, essentially where they are, and that's that. And it's it's just this. It's like a it's a small farm. Like she has, I think total she owns eleven goats. So and that's very good. different, right? Yeah. But and she'll do like her area because she has another she has like another day job and then we'll come by every day and check on them and feed them. Right. And I appreciate it. A couple of people that just kinda of give you the ghost and say here and it's like oh, I don't like yes. that. But yeah. call me with it then. I love the best way you do know <laughs> I wanted to get a go to my yard or permits or you have to have so much land. You got, you, got, you got to talk to your own town about okay. that. <laughs> but 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 I'm going to tell you you don't you don't need much land. You don't need much at all. Uh, for though somebody asked me earlier, I mean, you just need some. Ex you only need a shed no bigger than a, like a garden shed because they need to be uh, dry, dry and then out of the wind. 